morning, everyone. So we've already solved the most difficult problem in computer science. Does anyone know what, what that is? We just solved it a few minutes, few seconds back. So that's one problem. I don't know if all of us combined, all the engineers, all the scientists combined could solve it permanently. Any thoughts on what that problem is? That's the second hardest problem. The first is to get the projector to work at the first second, at the first instance. So we are very fortunate that we've been able to solve it. We've had varieties of issues. I'm going to be talking about AI, machine learning. Again, a big set of buzzwords. But before I start talking, what does come, what does come to your mind when I talk about the words like AI, machine learning? Apart from the money, right? You get paid a lot when you learn these set of skills. Yes? Anyone? This is not a formal, this is supposed to be a discussion, so don't worry. All answers are correct answers. Yes? What comes to your mind when you hear artificial intelligence machine learning? Apart from the fact that you have to wake up at 11 a.m. and come for this SRIP session, what else does come to your mind? Robotics. Robotics. Okay, excellent. Yes? Autonomous cars. Yes, good. Yes? Human behavior inside the machine. Okay. So you're going to the other extreme. Yes. What else? Super intelligence. Super intelligence. So we also have people across different disciplines, I'm assuming, right? So what does AI mean to you? For people in, you know, for people in let's say, social sciences, artificial, artificial intelligence, machine learning could mean something else. Whereas for people in, let's say, electrical engineering, it could mean something else, right? So I'm going to be talking about machine learning, artificial intelligence as an enabler, right? There will be two, three key points that I want you to take away, and I'll mention them right away. One, we have to think about artificial intelligence, machine learning as a part of the system, and not as the end goal in itself. We have to think about the ethical aspects of artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and not just because many of us are engineers, right? We get very fascinated by cool technology, and we want to just build things without even knowing what are the, the negative aspects of it. So when we talk about machine learning applications, we find quite a few of them inside a phone, right? So a phone is a, are the closest thing to us right now, right? So we can perhaps go without a water bottle, we can go without money, anything, but going without phone is hard these days. So when we talk about things like Apple Siri, Google Now, and now the defunct Windows Code, am I being recorded? Yes? Okay, so I'll have to be a little polite then. So Cortana is now not being used that much. Windows Phone is not being used, developed that much. So Google now, Apple Siri. So you, you have various kinds of things, right? Which application are you likely to use next, right? Does your phone show you that? Which movie should you be watching? Or when you ask one of your assistant, right, you ask them something. What is the weather in, in your city, right? So there's a bunch of things which happen under the hood. One your speech is taken into consideration. It's converted into some text, right? That text is searched on the database, on internet. It's looked at various different places. The result is returned, right? So all of this is happening under the hood. All of this is machine learning AI. And the result is returned, and it is returned to you in a friendly fashion. It's, sometimes it's through speech. That speech is not a human being behind the, behind the Apple or the Google or the Microsoft servers. They're sitting and they're speaking out something, right? It's actually a computer voice, which is now mimicking human voice. So this is again showing some other applications. Which application am I going to use next? Now, the same technology is also being used when you watch Amazon Prime, when you watch Netflix, right? Anyone on here who is not on Amazon Prime, not on Netflix, any of those? You get recommended these movies, right? Okay, so perhaps even if you're not on these platforms, uh, you would have seen Amazon, right? If you purchase something, what does Amazon tell you to purchase? If you purchase the book on statistical mechanics or anything, what is the book that will be recommended? Will you be recommended uh, Robin Hood? Or would you be recommended some dynamics, something, you know, some, some elementary physics, something like that? Which one? Probably the second one, right? Because there, again, the idea is that what book are you likely to be reading next? What is useful to you, right? So that's a very specific application of machine learning. It's called recommendation. Right? 
So how many of you go to the grocery store? Have you started going back to the grocery store, discovering things after the COVID break? Right? You go to these big malls. How many of you have been to such malls or stores and you wanted to buy a toothpaste or a toothbrush? And the person in front of you is buying literally the whole home? Been there? And they don't have cash also sometimes. And they'll take each and every rupee sikka back. Seen that? You get frustrated, you know, you want to go back home, you want to watch your movie or you want to play something, right? So can machine learning AI do something? It's a question to you. I have the answer. It's a question to you. Yes. Can you do something? I've still not defined what is machine learning. Think of it as some cool technologies which will replace redundant effort. Right? Can you automate something here which will make the queues smaller, which will reduce the waiting time? OK. That's my next slide. Yes. Yes, someone saying? Easy checkout for small products. That doesn't even require machine learning. So that's an interesting concept. So that's precisely the point which I also wanted to show, to highlight. You don't need complicated technologies for everything. If you can put in some amount of human effort. So in, in many of the grocery stores in the US, such departmental stores, you have separate counters called five or less. If you have five or less items, you directly go to them. Right? It doesn't make sense for if you're, if you're buying five items to go to the regular counters. That does not require very complicated technology. That's just a separate counter. Right? And you also have self-checkout stores. You might have seen self-checkout counters. Right? So there you just go, you scan the barcode, like you have it at your library. Right? You can just scan the barcode, you can directly go away. You don't need to interact with the human. But let's see what concept Amazon came up with. Four years ago, we started to wonder, what would shopping look like if you could walk into a store, grab what you want, and just go? What if we could weave the most advanced machine learning, computer vision, and AI into the very fabric of a store so you never have to wait in line? No lines, no checkouts, no registers. Welcome to Amazon Go. Use the Amazon Go app to enter. Then put away your phone and start shopping. It's really that simple. Take whatever you like. Anything you pick up is automatically added to your virtual cart. If you change your mind about that cupcake, just put it back. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. So how does it work? We used computer vision, deep learning algorithms, and sensor fusion, much like you'd find in self-driving cars. We call it Just Walk Out Technology. Once you've got everything you want, you can just go. When you leave, our Just Walk Out Technology adds up your virtual cart and charges your Amazon account. OK, so that was a very cool demo from Amazon. And these stores are actually live. These are not just concepts. So let's say that we are, you know, we are thieves, right? We don't want such technology to work, or we want the technology to work in our favor. So where do you think this technology would fail? Could you design some scenarios? Could you act as an adversary? Could you act as a thief so that you can gain the system? What would you do? Hide, sorry? Hack the cameras. Let's assume that Amazon has built a really good cybersecurity team. You can't hack the cameras. But what he's saying is there's an answer to this, right? OK. I was also thinking the same. Like, so we all think alike. So you pick up something, right? You pick up, let's say, a can of uh, juice, right? You pick it up and you bring an empty can from your home and you place it back, right? But I'm assuming they have weight sensors also. So you'll have to go probably a step ahead. You'll have to fill it with a similar density liquid, right? And then close it, right? I mean, you can go all that way if you want to really do that. I don't encourage. But other ways, you could fool the system.
Sorry? I steal someone's phone and go You could do that. Yeah, you steal someone's phone, but then that becomes a very rudimentary. That becomes a very basic kind of stealing. That's similar to you steal someone's credit card and their password. Yes. So you could also find the camera blind spots, right? So there are spots where the cameras don't see. You'll have to figure that out. Like if you're a thief, you have to get some work done. You have to figure out what are the blind spots. You stand in those places. But these are all from thinking from an adversary, right? But think about the ethical implications of such kind of technology. Uh, so do you think there could be some other downsides to this besides the technology failing? What do you think? Sorry, over expenditure. So this is actually technology is being produced to, to reduce the expenditure because humans are expensive. You have to pay for sick leave, you have to pay for various kinds of things, for protests, whatever. Right? So in terms of cost, this is more beneficial. That's why companies want to roll that out. Yes. Yes, loss of employment, right? So think of it in this way. Just because the, the people who are working in the checkout counters, they don't know machine learning, they don't know Python, they don't know all of these sort of cool technologies, should they go out of job suddenly? Does that sound right? No? If this sounds right, think about it as what will happen to your career. Let's say you are also skilled, but you're not sufficiently skilled in some kinds of work. Do you go out of job? Do artists go out of job? Right? That's something to think about. Right, what happens to all the people who are not skilled in the specific aspects? Right, that's an important aspect I want to bring in today's discussion. Think about the technology, but also think about the implications long term. Right? Think about how it affects different kinds of people, right? not just us. And I'm repeating this because as a technologist myself, I have always had this urge to create something. Right? You want to create something, it looks very cool, you can combine all these sensors. Uh, it looks fancy, but at what cost? So let's look at another application. A billion people are estimated to live in poverty around the world. That's a billion people living on less than $2 a day. Poverty reduction is one goal that almost everyone can agree on. Last year's United Nations Sustainable Development Goals set 169 separate development targets to be met by the year 2030, with poverty reduction as a principal goal. But how do we actually track progress towards these goals? Right now, our ambitions exceed our capabilities. Most countries don't collect much data, and scaling up traditional household survey-based data collection efforts will be expensive. What if less conventional data sources could help shed light on these development outcomes? That's what our project does. We combine high-resolution satellite imagery with powerful machine learning algorithms to predict how rich or poor specific locations around the world are. But standard machine learning approaches to interpreting imagery work best when they have lots of data. Think millions of labeled images. Unfortunately, there are few places in the world where we can tell the computer with certainty whether the people living there are rich or poor. Our solution is to combine high-resolution daytime imagery with images of the Earth at night. Places that are brighter at night are usually more developed. We use this night light data to help us find features in the higher resolution daytime imagery that are correlated with economic development. Without being told what to look for, our machine learning algorithm learns to pick out many things that are easily recognizable, such as roads, urban areas, waterways, and farmland. So that was another different application of machine learning AI systems. The idea is that measuring the income level of the whole world is a very hard project. Right? You have to, like in India, you have the census project. You would have seen the amount of employees it takes to collect census data, and it's done every 10 years. Right? It's impossible to maintain that scale every year. So that's another important aspect which is coming through this presentation, scale. Whenever you want to scale some estimates, you use things like, you use automation, you use machine learning. Right? So think about this technology being deployed in the US and in India, where you're using things like night light. Right? The, amount of, the amount of light that you have in the night is generally seen as an indicator of urbanization. Right? More urbanization, more lights in the night. And more economic development, that's what they think. Do you think this will work across the India and certain parts of Europe and the US and, let's say, North America in the same way? Do you expect some difference? Sorry? 
So in India, you have, like in, in Mumbai, you'll have slums right next to you know, big buildings. So what do you do? What is the income level? Can you figure that out? No. So that's another corner case. Secondly, a lot of the parts of Southeast Asia are highly polluted. More pollution means that the light won't travel. It won't be captured by the satellite. Right? So it's, it's a shortcoming, but not really a very big shortcoming because you're still getting some estimates. The next application I'd like to share about is that as a kid, I never liked talking on the phone when I would be randomly told by, suddenly told by my parents to talk to some random, you know, some, some random relative. I, they'd always pester me, right? Who am I and what, how am I related to so one? So I never liked that. So let's see if technology can do something for that. You might have seen this presentation from four or five years back. This is Sundar Pichai. To make your haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon, what happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. What's happening out here? Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, so what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now? Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. So that was an application, let's say, if you, if you have to look at some service, you have to get some service booked, you have to book a flight ticket, something like that. It's, it seems that the technology is very cool, it can help you, right? It can, the, the, the icing on the cake here was that when the machine said, mm -hmm, which is a very typical American sort of pause, right? Um, why would you be worried about such, such a technology? Oh, no worries, this is very cool technology, I don't have to call anyone. It solves all my problems. Impersonation, yes. Someone, so now at this stage, you're not clear whether you're talking to a human being or you're talking to a machine, right? I think we deserve to know whom we're talking to. Right? What could be some other downsides? Yes? Okay. 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 So, so what he's saying is that there's a human element of, of making decisions, which is very hard to capture by any machine, right? Because you cannot also describe it, right? What goes on in your head, whether you play or not play, it's it's, it's a very complicated process. Yes. Okay. 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 Right. So verification. Right. So that that's always a concern. Yes. Yes. Sorry. The, oh, black. Yeah. You think black? Okay. So so the word black means that someone is you know, scamming, or they're, they're trying to artificially inflate the prices, right? Uh, that can potentially happen, yes. Yes, social interaction, right? So, so we are anyway a WhatsApp generation, right? You compare to the older generation, and I, I'm, I'm always shocked when I see the older generation. How can they directly call people and ask what they need? How's that even possible? We have to think too many, we have to think a few times, we'll probably think, should I write? Should I write an email? Should I write a WhatsApp? Should I, write, should I drop an SMS? Right? So it's become, and especially during the COVID times, it's become inconvenient to, to directly approach people, right? And the social anxiety will increase if such technologies are there, right? Um, right, so that's, that's a very important point. There was another related aspect to this. I think 
at some point of time, the company has decided that you cannot use assistants as the way you like. So I think what happened was there were people or the maybe small children whose behavior was getting wrongly affected. They would shout at the assistant, right, at the virtual assistant. If you, if you did that in a real assistant, then you'd probably get a slap, right? But the virtual assistant won't say anything. And that's very wrong behavior to, to think someone as subservient to you. Right? Let's look at another cool application. We're thinking about now saving energy. Honey. What's up? Whoa. How did we use that much energy last month? Hello. Who are you? I'm Bidgley, your personal energy advisor the utility company sent me. How did you get in here? You downloaded my app. <laughs> All right. Well, let's see how your energy consumption compares with your neighbors. Yikes. What do you mean, inefficient? We just bought this new refrigerator. Take it easy. We'll figure this out. Let's see. Looks like your base load is pretty high. You've probably got some big offenders that are pulling power 24-7. Here's a couple of examples. I thought that you were getting rid of that Xbox. I, uh... Yeah, I'm with her. You get rid of this man cave machine, you could reduce your base load by 10%. Really? Yeah, and that's just the beginning. Oh, wow. Looks like you guys had a pretty wild weekend, huh? <laughs> Wait. Here? Yeah. No, no, we were out of town. Oh, looks like your AC didn't get the memo. Did you forget to turn it off before you left, guys? That sounds about right. Well, that made a pretty big dent. It's all good. In the future, oh. I'll send you texts whenever I see a spike like that. Oh. I'll even go you one better. With this guy, you can control your thermostat from anywhere. Bidgley, this is awesome. <laughs> Save your praise, my friends. I'm just getting warmed up. So this was showing an application of machine learning to tell how much of different, how much energy each appliance is consuming. So this is some, some kind of work which we have also done in the past. The idea is that your electricity meter already captures the total amount of energy consumed in the home, right? How many of you have seen the electricity meter at home? How many of you have seen the electricity meter when you turn on the AC? and you wait and see how quickly the red LED flashes. See that? It's a fun exercise. So for the, for the kinds of meters where you have the red LED flashing, and there are the kind of meters where you have the rotation thing, right? So as a kid, I always used to turn on different appliances just to figure out, right? That's the essential idea. Each appliance has its own unique signatures, signature, like AC consumes high amount of power. It's a compressor-based appliance. The compressor turns on and off. You have fridge, which is also compressor-based appliance. You have other kinds of appliances, electronics. Each of them have their own signatures. The idea is that given the total energy consumption, can you break it down into different appliances? So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, that kind of a problem. Self-driving cars, we have seen a lot, at least the videos. I'm going to skip that. But I'm going to show you a funny aspect of self-driving cars. So this is what a self-driving car sees. This left one is a car. This one is a car. There's a bicycle and a person, right? So what does it do now? Right? Again, you, because the machine doesn't have intelligence. It maybe doesn't have enough sensing capabilities. If it had, it would have also figured out the depth, right? It doesn't have the capabilities. So it may get confused. So how many of you have driven a vehicle in, in foggy conditions? Or, or if you've been in foggy conditions in the morning? So people here probably, so localites might not have experienced it, but people coming in from north, uh, north parts of India, they would have probably seen a lot of fog. So has anyone been in foggy conditions and seen only one light coming from, from the opposite end? And only if, when you're very close, realize that it's actually a car and only one of the light is working. Anyone seen that? Right, so that's the kind of human limitation, but this is just the machine limitation. The human is still able to adjust at some point of time. You can use machine learning for the farm. So, so here the idea is that can you put, strategically put sensors at different parts of a farm to figure out how much water each part of the farm needs? Can you strategically figure out where to weed? Can you strategically figure out should you be even watering or not? Looking at the forecast, right? So this is a part of the whole system 
where you have to put in, put in a bunch of sensors. You have to do the estimates, because you can't put a sensor at each point on the ground. You have to estimate things like moisture content or the soil nutrition at each point. And then all of this information has to be relayed. Now, many of us would have been to rural parts of India. Right? Do you get cell connectivity? It's improved a lot, but you get cell connectivity everywhere. What do you do then? How do you think the data can be transmitted when you don't have cell connectivity? Satellite, perhaps you can, perhaps it's expensive. Yes? Yes. What else could you do? So have you noticed that, that there would be parts of India where they don't have, they don't get 24 cross 7 water electricity, but they still have TV. Everyone seen that? You can go to any village, you'll see someone with a TV, right? So the idea here in this, in this particular project is, OK, how many of you have actually looked, seen the TVs, when, seen television when you had actually got antennas at home? Anyone old enough to see that? OK. So have you seen that when you were adjusting the antennas or when you were tuning between different channels, there is that noise that you see, right? That, that image that you see with gray and black kind of dots. Have you seen that? Yes? So that thing is known as a white space. So that's a space between two different channels. Right? That's an empty space because each channel has a corresponding frequency. But there's some frequency gap between different channels. And you use that to transmit the data. That's the idea here. Right? That's not a machine learning project, but that's one of the central themes which I've stuck onto for this presentation. Machine learning AI is a part of the system. Here, an important aspect of the system is how do you transfer the data? You use something known as white spaces, TV white spaces for doing that. Healthcare. So let's look at this application. So my aunt has congestive heart disease, and recently she was rushed to the hospital. Luckily, she survived, but chronic diseases don't happen overnight, and problems with them happen cumulatively. So if our homes actually monitor health, particularly for chronic disease patients, we can avoid many of these hospitalizations. Now the question is, how do you monitor health at home? Unfortunately, the picture today is not very lovely. If you want to monitor breathing, you need nasal probe or chest band, heartbeats, pulse oximeter, motion for Parkinson patients. You have to ask them to wear all of these sensors on their body. Uh, falls is something on their neck. And sleep, you have to ask them to put all of these electrodes on their heads and sleep with it. What if somebody comes and tells you that we can monitor all of those things in the home without asking the patient to wear any sensor on their body. That's exactly what I do in my group. We invented smart Wi-Fi box that uses the wireless signals around you to monitor your breathing, your heartbeat, your gait, falls, even sleep, and all of that without putting any sensor on the body. Now, you might be surprised, but actually, you guys are sitting here, you are in a sea of wireless signals, Wi-Fi, cellular, everything. And every move that you do, you lift your arm like this, it changes the electromagnetic fields. And those changes, actually we analyze them with AI algorithms in our box. And we know you lifted your arm, you took a breath, or this is your heartbeat. And without any sensors on your body. Let me show you a video of this. This is a home, and the wireless signal spread in the home. And actually they reflect off our bodies and come back to our smart wife. I don't know why this failed, but technology has limitations. So this was not a part of the this is not a part of the plan, but this video has stopped. Does it work? No. Okay. So what you're seeing here is that we have a sea of wireless signals, right? So this thing also is a wireless signal. Does anyone know, does anyone know what frequency this thing works at? Yes, no? Engineers figure this out. This will be in a quiz, otherwise you won't get a certificate. Yes? Can you can you ensure that? Just kidding. Just kidding. You don't need that. But this thing, so, so that's also something I'd love all of you to figure out. Like, be curious about things. How do things work? You're all engineers, scientists, researchers, right? So here you're sending out different kinds of wireless signals, and they'll be reflected back based on your motion, based on how you're acting, right? So it, it can even detect your breathing, because that leads to movement in your chest, and it's able to detect that, right? 
But here again, what's important is to understand that you need to have domain knowledge. You need to understand that how wireless signals work. You get some signal, you acquire some data, and after that, you use machine learning. So it's a part of the system, not the end and all. Auto reply, many of you of us have used this. Now, think about auto reply. Do you, when you get auto reply suggestions, generally you reply amongst auto reply, right? We get lazy. Do we reply something outside? Probably not. So we're being presented biased information, right? Now think of taking this to an extreme. So I've, I'm assuming many of you have been on flights, right? Do you know that most of the flights these days are just operated by the autopilot? Right? The pilot doesn't have to do a lot of things. Right? They put the flight on the, the plane on the autopilot and they can sort of sit and relax, they can monitor everything. Right? But there was recently some, not recently, some time back I read the study where they were put, some pilots were put in very difficult conditions right? and they were not able to recover from them. Why? Because they've got extremely used to autopilot. Right? Now imagine going around a city without Google Maps. How did the previous generation do? They would either print out a map, they would ask on the way, but wouldn't that be weird for us? You have to stop your vehicle, you have to ask people where to go, and most of the times people will give you wrong directions, right? Does anyone know this person? The name is Lee Sodol, right? There was a game of Go, which is an ancient Chinese, I believe Chinese game, where the machine beat Lee Sodol, who was the world number one, right? Now let's look at the human aspect of this. After being defeated, this world number one retired. He felt that he's reached a point where the machines have reached a point, the human can never beat the machine. Right? Imagine this happening in other sports. Right? What will happen if tomorrow Novak Djokovic says that I'm retiring because machines are very good? Right? It's, it's not a good, or I have to retire because a machine can teach better than me. Right? It's not a good state to be in. So we have to think about these aspects also. This application became very common during COVID. There were tons of papers, right? So you had input chest X-ray images or CT scans. There was a system which looks at these and tells whether the pneumonia positive or negative or COVID positive or negative. So there was a very interesting study which came about. So most of these images, and in, in, in a certain case, they ended up focusing only on one part of the image, right? What do you think that part of the image is? And that system was very, very accurate in detecting COVID. What do you think that is? What is the part of the image which will tell you everything about COVID? Sorry? So everything is lungs, but what part of the lungs? Sorry? Alveoli? So that's a medical term, right? I don't know the details, but maybe that's a good guess, yes. What? part of the image do you think is most informative in telling whether you have COVID or not? Okay. Okay. Okay, other guesses? Okay, other guesses? Yes. Okay, so you're looking at congestion. Okay. So it's very hard for me to control my smile at this point of time, because the answer is very, very different as to what you're expecting. The most important part which tells whether a person is COVID positive or negative is the label of the lab which took the test. Generally, the lab puts the label, right? SRL diagnostics or some other diagnostics, right? Now, this worked because most of the images that they had in the data set, right, which were coming from a certain lab were patients who were already unwell, right? Most of them were COVID positive. The images which were coming in from a lower degree lab, right? people didn't really need a, a very high fidelity CT scan, they were COVID negative. So when you're next time worried about AI taking the world, just think about this example. Right? AI can tell you to how to take a good selfie. So I'm not going into the details, but so some of the aspects, someone has done a study, they show that your face should occupy one third of the image and you should cut off your forehead. So next time when you're thinking about this, you should think about this. Uh, how many of you remember this guy? Now you would probably know because the coach of the Indian men cricket team, right? Does anyone know this instance? What image is this? Any, any uh, quiz people here? Yes? Yes? 2003. In Melbourne. 
I vividly watch, remember watching this game. India won the match. Rahul Dravid scored the winning run, something like that. You can give certain images, and now machines can label them for you, right? So think about, so previously we have seen that we can search across text, right? That's easy, easier. But can you also search across images? Can you get some data? So previously, if you had to figure out an image of Rahul Dravid, let's say, you would have to have some text accompanying an image, right? Or a caption which tells that this is Rahul or this is some person X, Y, Z, right? But this, this can now, machines have become advanced, machine learning techniques have become advanced. They can tell you various kinds of things. You can also do a back and forth communication, right? You can show an image, you can ask questions. So this is known as visual question answering. You have a visual image, you have a question, what is the mustache made of? And the machine learning system can tell bananas. You can have chatbot-like systems, right? But now we come to the other aspects, some of the other aspects, why machine learning is scary. And I already see some of you watching the time, so I'll be a little quick. So Uber had a self-driving crash, right? So it's a philosophy question now, right? So let's say you are sitting in a self-driving car, right? You're sitting on the back rear seat. There are three or four people coming in, right? Let's say there's a young family with two kids, right? And you are a 60-year-old man, right? Now you have, the car has two options. It takes a very hard left swerve. The car will get damaged and you will probably die or it kills the four people. What do you do? What do you do? Yes, anyone? Yes. Sorry, kill them? So he's saying that you'll kill them because the rational is that the rational is that the car belongs to you. Your life is important, right? The other way to think about this is in terms of the net people killed, the four people will get killed. Maybe it makes sense to kill yourself in order to save those four people. And maybe they're younger, you know, there's various kinds of questions, but these are very difficult questions. That's why technology should not be independent of the of the law, of the various kind of regulations. They need to be thought about, right? And philosophy questions. Now, this is a very important problem. Google has sort of improved it. So there are various languages like Turkish, right? Which are general neutral languages. So general neutral means that both the female and the male are uh, represented by the same pronouns. So he is a babysitter, gets translated to obir, bebek, baki, shishi. And when you write obir, bebek, baki, shishi again back, it gets translated to she's a babysitter. Similarly, she's a doctor gets translated to obir, doctor. And obir, doctor, when translated back, is he's a doctor. So this is showing you the various kinds of biases which exist. They have now improved it. Right? Google has improved this long time back. But this is showing that this can be not a very good solution if it's such kinds of biases are not at rest. So this is Google Photos, I believe, or something like that. Unfortunately, like, so unfortunately, these, some, someone is being labeled as gorillas. We may laugh about it, but think about you being that person, right? And the problem actually is very serious because it's likely that people of certain gender, certain races, may be, are, are more likely to be captured by the police, by automatic systems, right? Which is unfortunate. Which one is the bride? The left one or the right one? Both. Which one will the system pick up? The left one, which is the Western, generally the Western notion of right, right? It's again a problem. Let's see how we can address this bias. Let's play a game. Close your eyes and picture a shoe. So why don't you do this exercise? So close your eyes, think about a shoe. And if you have a notebook, draw, draw a shoe for us. If you have a notebook with you, or at least draw in your mind if you don't have a notebook. It's an important exercise. Yes, has everyone pictured a shoe? OK, let's go back, watch the video. Let's play a game. Close your eyes and picture a shoe. OK, did anyone picture this? This? How about this? We may not even know why, but each of us is biased toward one shoe over the others. Now imagine that you're trying to teach a computer to recognize a shoe. 
you may end up exposing it to your own bias. That's how bias happens in machine learning. But first, what is machine learning? Well, it's used in a lot of technology we use today. Machine learning helps us get from place to place, gives us suggestions, translates stuff, even understands what you say to it. How does it work? With traditional programming, people hand code the solution to a problem, step by step. With machine learning, computers learn the solution by finding patterns in data. So it's easy to think there's no human bias in that. But just because something is based on data doesn't automatically make it neutral. Even with good intentions, it's impossible to separate ourselves from our own human biases. So our human biases become part of the technology we create in many different ways. There's interaction bias, like this recent game where people were asked to draw shoes for the computer. Most people drew ones like this. So as more people interacted with the game, the computer didn't even recognize these. Latent bias. For example, if you were training a computer on what a physicist looks like, and you're using pictures of past physicists, your algorithm will end up with a latent bias, skewing towards men. And selection bias. Say you're training a model to recognize faces. Whether you grab images from the internet or your own photo library, are you making sure to select photos that represent everyone? Since some of our most advanced products use machine learning, we've been working to prevent that technology from perpetuating negative human bias. From tackling offensive or clearly misleading information from appearing at the top of your search results page, to adding a feedback tool on the search bar so people can flag hateful or inappropriate autocomplete suggestions. It's a complex issue and there's no magic bullet, but it starts with all of us being aware of it so we can all be part of the conversation. Because technology should work for everyone. So I think this video presented some, some nice takeaways. One, there is no magic bullet. And secondly, technology should work for everyone. So to think about these things. Uh, last two slides, probably. I know that so I'm, I'm between you and lunch, probably. Everyone recognizes this person, I believe. It got me thinking about my full-time employees and their ability to survive on $8 an hour in New York City. And foremost in all of our minds has been the loss and the grief felt by the people of Orlando. Most of us don't get our health care through the marketplace. We get it through our job or through Medicare or Medicaid. And what you should know is that thanks to the Affordable Care Act, your coverage is better today than it was before. Women can get free checkups and you can't get charged more just for being a woman. To give his employees a together to pass a common there's a bill that would boost America in very, very hard times. Some progress, at least in, within the small confines of the legal community. I think it's real important. Uh, here we go. Uh, President Barack Obama, uh, when you uh, giving a speech, uh, make sure you use uh, a lot of pauses. America's businesses have created 14.5 million new jobs over 75 straight months. We are developing technology. Every technology can be used. So, so think about such technology around the election time in India, where let's say one of the major parties' leader is shown wrong, in, in, in a wrong sense, right? They're just shown uh, with, with some inflammatory speech, right? Think of the implications of that, right? But that's not all the negative aspects. There are some positive aspects to it also. So, for example, you have, how many of you have seen different kinds of children's magazines or children's books? You would have probably seen, right? Um, so, so I was thinking about this. So we were always, we were initially taught things like Jack and Jill went up the hill, right? But it's very rare for us friends to have names like Jack and Jill, right? It's, it's a more Western thing, like. Similarly in other cartoons also, right? So the question is, can we make them culturally more appropriate? Now, if you get designers to read all the illustrations, it will take them 10 years. It will take them a long time, right? Can you use such technologies to do a transfer across more culturally appropriate cartoon illustrations, things like that? And that's being done. So some leading institutions in India are also trying to do that. So there are ways in machine learning, there are ways part of such systems where you're generally trying to break the system. So for example, this image is predicted as a panda. Right? But if you add this imperceptible, human imperceptible noise, right? you can't, if this noise is added here, you can't really see a difference. Right? 
but the machine now sees this as a gibbon. This is completely wrong. So you can act as an adversary, create such kinds of system which break the machine learning system and which can break hell. Right? So this is the point where I introduce machine learning, just the one slide, and with that we'll end. So it's a field of study which gives the computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Right? There are more definitions, I'll probably just stop at this. Uh, I know I'm a few minutes over time, but I can take any questions, and we can then end the session there.